So CRISPR-Cas9 is basically just a genome editing technique that allows targeted um, DNA genes to be edited or cut out by a protein known as Cas9. And Cas9 really just acts as the pair of scissors that accomplishes this. So a really quick rundown of how it works is that a scientist or researcher, whomever it may be, creates a guide RNA, better known as a gRNA, that matches the um, targeted DNA that needs to be modified. This gRNA is then added along with Cas9 to, um, to a cell, and then after the gRNA um, locates the targeted DNA sequence, the, the Cas9 comes into play and cuts off the sequence. And then they both leave the scene. And then the new, and then the old piece of DNA is then replaced by a new piece of DNA, and the end snippets where the cut was made are later replaced by different enzymes. Dogs specifically, they have the same kind of chromosomal preparation in order to go into the karyotyping process, which I would think, okay, usually like chimpanzees people mention or mice, but they never really mention dogs as really having similarities to humans. So then after researching, I really found that dogs are a man's best friend. And that's, I say that because um, dogs have more ancestral DNA in common with humans than mice do, which is really something that's striking and I don't feel like that's really well known. And that basically means that we have a lot of similarities in terms of genetic pathology. So that means with the causes and reasoning behind the diseases, we really can look at dogs and be able to apply that to human medicine. So methylation consists of um, adding different methyl groups to a certain gene, and doing so um, would uh, turn off the, the transcription enzyme that, that transcribes that gene, and therefore the gene would not be um, apparent. It would not go through the whole process of amino acids and then creating into a protein, so it wouldn't be apparent in the body. So if there wasn't this DNA methylation did not occur, then the transcription enzyme would come and uh, take the gene and uh, express it. Now, the societal impact of the CPMC is actually pretty large. So what it does is it evaluates how useful it is to report genetic and non-genetic risk information to patients and participants. So they only will take um, like reasonable, actionable conditions to identify behavioral changes. So after the um, results do come in, they will advise these participants and patients whether or not to change certain things in their lifestyle, such as diet, um, exercise, what environments they're exposed to, and things of that nature. Oligos are really important because you can't do anything that we do in Coriolis without them. Um, you need them for uh, research in DNA because you need to amplify DNA to st study research. Right? You need it to um, attached to genes when you need to figure out if somebody has a genetic disease or not. They're, they're imperative. You can't do anything without them. So of course that's, there's a heavy impact on Coriel because of that. What if we use Coriel itself as the idea of a biobank and applied it to the marine aspect? What if we had a specific deep sea marine environment biobank? We don't go down to the bottom of the ocean very much. We know more about our own moon which is about 200,000 miles away from us than we do about the ocean. which at any given time is probably about a thousand miles away from us. We've gone to map the entirety of the deep sea, but we have not actually gone down there to examine the animals down there. We don't know what's down there. And when we do go down there, it's not very often, it's not very long. So what if we had, prior to doing you know, a long-term project of going and examining these deep sea environments, we had a bank set up where as soon as we go down, we find these animals, we go and take a, a skin punch, and then from there, we're able to immediately set it up and get it ready for cryogenics, that way it can be examined later on. A karyotype is a picture analysis of an individual's chromosome. It doesn't have to be a person, it can be an animal or even a plant. So one important thing to remember is that while karyotyping, it is important that the cells have to be in the metaphase form of mitosis. So different technologies or methods used, there's classic karyotyping, there's the molecular array, CGH, and there's also the fish. So there's a lot of different applications for flow cytometry and there's really a lot of promise in this field of study. So the number one use for a flow cytometer is to diagnose leukemia and lymphoma. Uh, doctors are able to actually put a real number on, um, on how many cancer cells there are and actually tell what type of leukemia or lymphoma. And they're actually very difficult to diagnose to begin with, so it gives them a degree of certainty to tell their patients.